Welcome to another edition of Trail Runner Nation. My name is Don Freeman. And I'm Scott War. Have you ever been faced with the frustration, and this is kind of rhetorical, Don, so don't, you, don't need to, you don't need to raise your hand. Oh. Have you ever been faced with the frustration of a persistent running injury that keeps you from enjoying running on the trails? Yeah, rhetorical, right? We all have. Well, in today's episode, we're going to explore the practical solutions from Dr. Matthew Silver's transformative guide called Built to Run. This is not born to run. Make no mistake, Mm -hmm. this is not born to run. This is built to run, fixing common injuries, dissolving pain, and optimizing running performance now and for life. And to help us overcome these step backs and to run pain free for life. Uh, Matthew is a seasoned physical therapist that has turned his own running pain and setbacks into a mission to help others. Matthew, thank you for joining us and, and sharing your knowledge with it. This is a big book. This is a this is something every runner should have on their shelf as a resource guide, I think. It's uh, I, when I started out, Scott, I mean, we were talking before we, we even, you know, we started recording of, man, this was, it was a passion project. You know, yes, I have this business in Maryland where we treat runners. I started out just treating runners, but I'm like, I, I, I knew I wanted to help more runners and create something that had a massive amount of value. And it all, I always came back to like the book, the book, a book. And eventually I just said, I, I, let me make it about running for them and then strength and mobility. And I'm like, let me just include all the main <laughs> topics, how to activate your arches. Uh, you just had Jay to cherry on, I think a couple of weeks ago and yeah. like, he's big on counter rotation. I'm like, that's so like he preaches it. I think it's massively important that again, affects, affects running for him. And also the last chapter is all about, you have runner's knee, you have IT band syndrome, you have plantar fasciosis. How can you solve those things? Well, all of the, you know, all the preceding chapters can help, but Hey, here's, what, what, do you, what do you do for mobility and strength and running form if you have plantar fasciosis? Boom, here's a guide to how to fix that as well. So it's very all-inclusive. It took, a, it took three years, but uh, a lot of time, energy, but it was definitely a passion project of how, how can I, how can we help more runners and built to run seem to be the, the best solution to that. So Matt, you listened to Jay Deshari and he talked about counter, rot- counter rotation and you agreed with him why do you think counter rotation is so important? And and maybe for some people that haven't heard Jay's podcast, what mm-hmm. the heck are you talking about? What is counter rotation? Yeah, counter counter rotation is when when you're running your thoracic spine, your mid back, and your pelvis they're they're rotating in opposite directions. It's actually just it happens when you walk too. And you've ever seen somebody walk or run and it's like they're fluid and it's smooth and it looks effortless. They're, 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 first of all, the running forms on point, but they're counter rotating They're that a lot of us have stiffness in our backs and stiffness in our hips. And we lose that counter rotation. Uh, but if you ever seen someone walk and they're like, man, they look super stiff. Uh, yeah. Their hips are probably tight, but they, their back is probably all locked up and they can't dissociate the two. So it's also called the spinal engine. Like I think of uh, you guys know, like a plyometric exercise when you're doing like jump rope and box jumps and depth jumps. You get that quick, uh, that quick stress followed by that quick contraction. When you get this counter rotation, you're actually getting a, it's a little bit of a, a, a plyometric contraction. You get that, your hips go one way, your pelvis goes, or your upper back goes the other way. There's a quick stretch and then it contracts out of it. And it just does that over and over and over again. Uh, and, so and, that, sorry, go ahead. And, and we talk about that a little bit, um, free energy. We talked to Dr. Marcus Kukazella years back about running gait, you know, the magic 180 steps per minute gait that allows mm-hmm. you to stretch ligaments or tendons and have them return free energy. And what you're suggesting is doesn't only happen in the foot for, for free energy, but it's also happening in counter rotation of torso and pelvis rotating and storing some energy and releasing it. So it's important to yep. get that counter rotation for some quote unquote free energy. Yeah. No, yeah. Cook is that. He's, I think he's in West Virginia too. He's not that far from me. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it is a hundred percent the same exact thing with running distance running. Uh, we want to be as lazy and as efficient as possible, yes. <laughs> not use as much energy. And if, if we can get free energy from our body, why not? And, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm big on running form. And I think, you know, some people might define it differently, but for me, running form is it. Yes. You don't want to overstride excessively and, and have this, um, this super aggressive heel strike, but 
there's so much more to it. Are you, you know, you slouched over like this when you're running? Well, if you're slouched over like that, it's going to be, a, you're, it's going to be really hard to get that proper counter rotation and to actually have your shoulders move back. And if there's so much to it, but counter rotation and the spinal engine, we call it the spinal engine. You get a lot of energy from that. Yeah, I think uh, I think uh, the image of Scooby Doo of uh, what's that guy Shaggy Shaggy, Shaggy. running, you know, <laughs> stooped forward, but but it really brought, but probably more important than Shaggy's image was the fact that when we get tired after long hours or miles or whatever wherever we're at, we start to lose some of that form. We start to mm. bend forward a little bit, and not only that, it becomes harder to run at that point because it is we've lost yep. some of those tools that we have. Mm. Good yeah. point, Don. And, and I love what I, I caught this. I think the reel you guys made with Jay was another part of running form. If you're too, if you're not strong enough to handle the loads of running, and if you're in a 10 mile race and your first mile looks great and your last mile looks trash, I mean, yes, you're tired. But again, like Doug Jay said, we, there's probably some capacity and some strength uh, that we're leaving on the table. Like we could be stronger to handle the loads of running and not that gravity just push us down as we get tired. Hmm. You know, this this book, it's it's a big book. This is not a reader's digest. This is a big book, all nearly three hundred pages. But one of the things that I love about it is it has a lot of diagrams and photos in there that help you visualize the concepts that that Matt's talking about. Um Matt, at, at the the intro of the show, I said that you took some of the pain uh, from your own running, so I assume you're a runner. You've gone to college, you've done all of the studies, taken all the tests, gotten all the certificates, um, and then you're, you're, you're going through this pain on your own. What did you find from your education that applied, and what did you find from experience and a practice that helped apply to help you with those, those issues? That's a good question. You know, like essentially what I learned in physio and PT school versus running on my own and what's right. worked the best. I, I, the first part of that question, don't let me forget the second part of on my own, but the first sorry, part of that, sorry, was... I, I usually, and, and by the way, I just want to give you kudos. You asked the question so much better than I did, <laughs> but yes, I, I try to complicate things and make uh, do uh composite uh, questions. So go ahead. And, and, and Matt, thank you for calling them out because usually that's my job that I try to do, but yeah. I love the fact that you're taking over. So let's proceed with what was question number one, Scott? I, what I was the, the level of wiseness? If you can simplify something there you <laughs> ten, go Scott. 10 words to two words it's more it's more <laughs> simple uh but yeah i think uh, number one for me was i mean i i've been injured a lot in high school and college and i went so i went to pt school we i mean pt school is great and it's a doctorate level program different countries they call them physios i just like the word physio but i learned a lot about joint mechanics and how joints function and move and how to a little bit about mobility but a lot of it was i think that we do a good job of learning how joints move that's a really big thing with physical therapy. Outside of that, I, I, I actually graduated in 20, it was 18 or 19. And I'm like, man, I, 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 I couldn't run more than two miles without knee pain. And I'm like, mm. here I'm a doctor. And I'm like, you know, you got this big ego. Ah, I'm a PT. I'm going <laughs> to you know, crush the world. I'm like, man, I, I want to treat runners, but I still can't run myself. So I had to take a deep dive into a lot of it was a lot, a lot of the stuff that's in the book. Some of it was from PT school, a lot, some of the mobility section, but a lot, even a lot of the mobility was. I had to learn on my own. I learned from Dr. Kelly Sturett, who's an, who's amazing at mobility. Uh, I learned from Jada Cherry on some running form stuff. Doug Adams, who's in Delaware, he's amazing with running form. So I, I spent like three or four years. I, I flew out, out west to learn from Jay. He had a course in Colorado. And I'm like, I, I want to have this passion of like, I knew there's the, like, if PT school didn't get me to the point where I could treat runners, I have to learn this on my own. So the book has just been a lot of that info of all these things I've learned uh, from, from these amazing mentors and again, Jay included. Um, so that's a part of how, how did I learn all this stuff and the, the stuff that's in the book? A lot of the education I've had was yes, a little bit of PT school, but outside of it. And I think the second part, Scott was like, what have I learned on my own from a running standpoint? Uh, I think a big thing, uh, I remember implementing running form changes and mm. overstriding was huge for me like like how did i fix myself i was a chronic overstrider and then once i learned how to not land far in front of my body and also improving hip mobility essentially is getting your leg more behind you getting more of a put like hip extension you're more of a push-off position that was huge and I, i've learned early on that there's like this pendulum of like if your leg swinging and a lot of us are we're tight on the back end we can't get the leg back here 
So we compensate and we, we kick it out too far in front. So uh-huh. learning these marching drills and learning to get my, I'll open up my hip flexors and get my leg more behind me, instead of it looking like this, it's mm. more of this, more, it's more of an even kind of pendulum swinging instead of being pushed forward. So that was a big thing for me was learning. I have really tight hips. Uh, and so learning how to improve that mobility was number one, but also running form. Those are two, even without any strength training, that got me to the point where I could run like six, seven, eight miles without any pain. So that, that was huge for me. So for you listening uh, on audio only, not uh, watching on YouTube, the pendulum he described was kind of a one-way pendulum. It went, the, the pendulum went forward, but didn't swing all the way the other direction. And so he's showing that we need to have equal forward and backward to make a pendulum have its full motion. Did I describe that correctly, Matt? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I don't, I don't know how perfectly forwards and backwards yeah. it is for optimal running form, but we definitely don't want to be like, it's all forwards and almost no on the back end. But that's a classic, I sit down all day at work, you know, I work on a computer and then I want to go run and, and be active after work. It's like your hips are stiff from that and you, you have no mobility and it's just that pendulum is just, it's forcing you forwards. And it's, it's hard to retrain that because that's what your body's adapting to. So it's kind of this two, I mean, it's more than twofold. It's three, four, fivefold. But a big thing that I, that I think a lot of people would benefit from is improving mobility, uh, getting more hip extension, and then adding some gait retraining. They complement each other very, very well. Matt, Don has changed the way that he has run uh, his running form since I started running with him. What? I, 15 I, I, years I look, ago. I look more like uh, Shaggy. <laughs> <laughs> but he ha- he really has worked on that and has done a great job, and it's made him a more efficient runner. I've dabbled in it, but I'm mm-hmm. still running the same. I'm probably overstriding, and I'm sure a lot of people that are listening to this are stuck in that same thing where they're, they're, they're not um, – or they're overstriding too much. What did you work on specifically that helped you get that hip mobility and change the pendulum so it was even rather than mm-hmm. extending out front? Yeah, uh, a big there's uh, there's two big ones, maybe a third. Have you guys heard? Has you, have you guys heard of the couch stretch? No, no. but I'm all for it. <laughs> You're, you had me at couch. Yeah, yeah exactly. So I, I, you can do watching TV. I think um, I put a full two hours. I stretched it to two hours last week. So I, I think I've dialed that one in. The Olympics are on, Matt. You got to sit <laughs> and, on the couch to watch the Olympics. You know, it, it, you can do it. You, you can use a couch. I, 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 I actually don't know why it's called that. I think that's why. Because someone's like, I could just do it, do, do it you know, uh, on the couch. Uh, essentially, it's like, um, you know, that one where you stand and you grab your ankle and you put your leg behind you. Yep. Yes. It yep. stretches out the front of the quad. There's, uh-huh. I mean, when we're stretching, there's, there's muscle, there's fascia, which is like, uh, this is what it's just all over the body that it, it, it kind of holds muscles together and keeps them in their compartments. It's like if you pull chicken, you know, if you're eating chicken and you pull the piece of chicken apart and it's like all that fibrous material, that's what fascia is. So when we're stretching things, we're, we're yes, we're stretching the muscle, we're stretching the fascia out. There's a neural response as well. A lot of things happening, but the couch stretch is your, your knees against like, if you're, it's almost like you're in like a lunge position, your knees on the ground and your knees, your, your, your heels like against your butt and the couch is yeah. essentially it's kind of keeping your your leg from from opening up so your that leg the heel stays close to your butt and you're it's a really good quadriceps and hip flexor stretch so it's it's and holding that for two minutes i think a big mistake people make when stretching and and mobility work is we don't do it for long enough two minutes tends to be this gold standard um I mean, you can go longer if you want, but two minutes tends to be minimum effective dose for long-term change. And I will say this, it's stretching also gives you an inhibitory, it's an inhibitory neural signal to the muscle. So doing this before you run, it might turn your quads off. So it typically we recommend do this after you run. You know, again, you're on the couch, it's at night, you're hanging out, you're watching the races, uh, which I mean, we, the U.S. has been doing amazing with the races. We could talk probably the whole time about that. But <laughs> going over the guy who got second in the steeple, that was an amazing race. I don't know if you guys saw that one, but that was amazing. But couch stretch, uh, you can do it against the wall. Sometimes that's a lot on the ankle. So the couch tends to it, it unloads that foot. Uh, but if you just Google couch stretch or uh, there's a one up, if you Google couch stretch Alpha Project Physio, we have one on YouTube that shows it. But holding that for two minutes, amazing stretch and amazing way to improve mobility and get that leg behind you. That's one of them. 
I, I, I would suggest instead of Googling it to go get Matt's book because <laughs> there's photos. I, yeah. I, I, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm just just by the number of pictures in here. I'm sure you have the couch stress somewhere in here yep. that it's a photo where you can you can see how it's done. And it, we, have, we have progressions, too. There's like when you start out, like when I started this, I could not get all the way up. And like, that's OK. There's three progressions. And sometimes you kind of get stuck between progressions. Nice. But in the book, it goes over. If you're at level one and you're like, I had the tightest hips in the world. Hey, there's a progression for that. If you're pretty mobile, it's it's funny. It's like we do, you know, for, for the business, we do workshops. We do like these marketing events where we'll go to a gym uh, and, and we show people how to open up for we do some CrossFit gyms and some running clubs where how can we improve mobility? The couch stretch is a staple. And we get all levels of t typically women tend to have a little more mobility. Us guys, we're just yeah. strong and stiff and <laughs> that's our <laughs> weakness. Uh, but you'll see some people just they have no problem doing it. And then other people are like, oh, I'm struggling. This is the worst <laughs> thing ever, which <laughs> might be a lot of runners out there. But if we can improve mobility of that hip extension, that is it's, it's, it's almost like you're putting yourself in that position of that push off and your heel lifts off. It, you're getting in the book. It actually goes over that. There's a picture of someone running and I believe it's a picture of, Oh, it might be a split squat, but uh, that couch stretch it's in that. It, it's very similar to that push off position. It's very similar to a lunge position in a split squat as well. Here's one of the crazy things to me. And I've wondered about this for a while. Maybe you can put it to rest. You know, we want to get better at climbing hills. So we go out and we do some, some repeats on a, on a, on a, on a, some vertical climb and we get, and it's hard. And we, mm -hmm. we just, we put everything into it or we want to get faster. So we run around the track and we do leg turnover and we watch our times both very hard. But one of the things that will help reduce injury and help make us faster stretching, it doesn't take a lot of effort that you just stay in mm -hmm. one spot and you hold it for two minutes and you lean into it, but don't you lean too much, keep it comfortable, but keep it challenged. That's pretty easy. Why don't we do yeah. it? I mean, let me say, why don't I do it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's it's not hot and sexy i think that's probably why it's like uh, everyone just loves to, to talk about hey oh i ran this pace or i went this fast you know no one's like hey dude i did this couch stretch the other day and it was <laughs> i crushed it i was i was dying that's like the humble thing to do uh and you can I mean, I mean you know everyone has an ego I, you know they love talking about how fast they run in their workouts i don't oh, think we sure. should stop doing that but i think if we give some importance to mobility and i want people to re realize too it's not like I'm not saying stretch, like if you're already really mobile and you're like, I'm going to do the couch stretch and become a better runner. The whole point of stretching and mobility, uh, a big part of it is getting you into proper positions. So you can optimize the use of your body where if you're already optimizing things, instead of spending time doing couch stretch, maybe we should be doing something else that like maybe more strength training or more plyo training or more of arch control uh, and activating using your big toe to activate your arches. So it's not everyone should be doing this, but if you can't get the progression three in the couch stretch and it's super stiff and, and it's like, I can't, you know, it's like, this is the easiest thing ever. Hey, yes, we should, we should probably do some couch stretch. And and you'll need to, to um, make this a little more clear for me. Part of that couch stretch, you said two different muscle groups, the quadricep, the front of the mm -hmm. thigh, that's going to stretch out. What, and that goes, yep. that goes to the, the front of the tibia, right? The shin and, and then up to the hip. Um, as that's part of the quadricep. And then the yep. other key muscle that's key for the pendulum, when we talk about that pendulum swinging forward and back, the back might be restricted from tight uh, hip flexor muscle, which you mentioned, iliopsoas yep. muscle, and it yep. goes from the front of the spine down to the femur. So that could, if that's shortened up through sitting at a computer all day and shortens up because we're mm. at a 90, you mm. end up with a short hip flexor or iliopsoas and you you can't get that kick, that knee going behind your torso because that muscle's so short. Therefore, the couch yep. stretch, is, stretch is brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, the, the psoas, like the, the psoas in general, causes so many problems for runners. And even like low back pain. Like, I mean, you know, Don, from I'm, as a chiropractor, you know that thing attaches to the lumbar spine. It actually has some attachments to the intervertebral discs. So when someone's like, I threw my back out, I'm like, we're looking right at the psoas. And I've yeah. done... Um, I think knee over toes guy has done a great job popularizing this, but even myself, I've done like uh, I put on, you guys know what a monkey foot is. It's like, you can like attach a dumbbell to your foot. And then I perform these, these hip flexions, these knee raises while I'm standing. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I've worked my way up to 25 pounds now. Hmm. And just, wow. I, I love like having a strong hip flexor. I'm a huge fan of it. Uh, but this couch stretch will help stretch that out. I actually have done, I've had a lot of success with patients and myself or releasing the psoas it's i mean it's a tough muscle to release you 
it's deep to like your intestines and some organs. So we have to be delicate with it. But if you can release your psoas, I find uh, Don that uh, Don and Scott that man, people psoas are just super stiff. Like, yeah, they're shortened, but it's like it's almost like this uh, garden hose that we're, I mean, we can stretch out the hose more. We could pull more pull more of the hose out. But if you got all these kinks in your hose, your hip flexor is not going to be able to contract. It's not going to be able to do what it's supposed to do. So releasing that, that I've had a lot of success releasing the psoas. Yeah, I would say we could geek, geek out for quite a while on the psoas and talk about it, but there's a lot of things to cover in that book besides just that. You know, what are the com most common things you see when runners come in? What are the type mm -hmm. of injuries or type of exercises we should think about for maintenance? I'm like Scott right now. I've got about seven questions there that I'm listing. So <laughs> go ahead and just pick one of those. Yeah, what are some of the common things? Yeah, that's that's a that's a good one. I think some of the common things, um, knee pain for sure. That's it. Just ends up being one of the most common. Where uh, I, we talked about it earlier, if you're doing this over striding, not able to extend your hip behind you, we end up being like the word quad dominant is thrown around a lot. Like the quad dominancy, it's the only reason that is a thing is my hips are super tight and my hammies and glutes are not as engaged as they should be. And my posterior chain is not as engaged as it should be. Well, why does that happen? We just end up sitting a lot and we end up sitting on our butt and just not using it as much. And then we end up in this quad dominant and it's again, over striding. It's just, you're really, really, you're just yanking. Your like quad is yanking on that kneecap. And then you get this excessive friction of the kneecap on the, on the, on the femur. And then you get this patellar, you know, this, this chondromalacia, whatever you want to call it runner's knee, knee irritation, even IT bend syndrome. So that's, that's probably the most common. And that's all, that's also why too, we have, again, this hip flexion tightness, lack of strength on the back end, over striding, and then it just, we're just jamming our knees into the ground. Boy, all of a sudden the light came on in my head because I've been dealing with a chronic knee pain uh, for months now. And I, I never equated it to, you know, working on my hip flexors and getting my psoas all, any of the, the mobility part, I, I, I'll tell you what I'm going to be doing during the Olympics tonight uh, when I'm couch sitting stretch. on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and, and Scott, then that's the thing about Jay's book and Matt's book. You know, there's when you have something chronic, unless you can identify some, you know, did did some bicycle hit me and I hit the ground? You know, unless you right. have yeah. some some event that happened and it's just come up over time, then we've got to look at body mechanics and see what might be off. Right. Yep. And things yeah, linger I, around. You guys are you guys have some answers. Yeah, I think, uh, and I, I believe Jay said this too. But I, it's I, I mean, a common reason for running related injuries can be training errors. Like, hey, you do too much too soon. You increase your mileage. I I hate using that as a scapegoat though. Anytime I see mm -hmm. a runner, I'm like, yes, we want to ask, what is your mileage? Are you new to running? Your experience to running? And when someone's coming in, they're like, I increased you no know, five miles this week and no increase in intensity. I'm like. I don't really think it's probably from that. Like there's, there's so much low hanging fruit that, that a lot of runners can work on. And uh, what we just talked about the hip, hip, like, like glute strength, uh, hip mobility, running form are all super low hanging fruit that we can solve problems with. And if it's, I've been running just the nature, I think it's the most uh, injury prone sport. I'm sure CrossFit's close second or, <laughs> or maybe CrossFit's more, I don't know, but I just, there's a lot of research into that where, uh, I, it's typically around like 50%, 50 percent of runners in a year are injured, which the definition of an injury is it stops you from training the way you want. And, it you know, it's, it's limiting you in doing functional activities, whether that's running or your job or even just moving around. So it's uh, I think the excuse of I did too much too soon or too much volume. It's true. It happens. But I, anytime I see somebody, I'm like, I take that into account. But imagine if you optimize all these other things. You probably could have actually handled that that volume that you that we think could possibly be causing issues. But I, I love looking at these things as, instead of just blaming it was volume, it was volume, it was intensity. Yeah, and, and you know you, that's the, my exact question to you is is it's not always volume. It's not. It was your volume was fine with the running gait you have, but with the running gait you mm -hmm. have when you increased your volume, that's when it all fell apart. Like you could have stayed at lower volume and live a long time without any problems. But as soon as you increase your intensity, bang, that problem shows up. So we've really got to look at gait all the time, not just volume. Yeah. I'm a and, big and, fan of gait. Yeah. No, I, I, I love that comment, Don, because I, I see it as like we're maturing as runners. Like when you're new, 
you don't have to like i don't want people to feel intimidated of like i want to get into the sport of running i mean as watching the olympics i think we're gonna have a running boom like we got we medaled in the ten thousand. that steeplechase was amazing we got two medals in the 15 i'm like <laughs> what like, i'm just glad we made a final in the let alone like <laughs> we, we, the u.s is winning these and meddling um but when i'm uh um uh, when i'm oh, shit, i lost my train of thought what was i talking about sorry what were we talking about don well, we were in the Olympics and we were talking about we're meddling now and you're just happy that we've got one but somebody in a final. And I, I, and I had a yeah, question. Running boom. Why do and, and say that running boom. Why do you think we've improved drastically over in this Olympics compared to oh, ones yeah, in yeah. the past? What about that? Yeah, that's I mean, I remember like you watch like how many kids, how many high school kids are breaking a four minute mile? Like it's it's a lot. I think. We're definitely doing a better job. I think training wise, I'm not as up to date with that. I think I, it drives my memory. I used to work in Virginia and that was I, uh, at Percival, Virginia. They won nationals like two years, Nike nationals two years in a row. And I got to know the coaches. Do you guys know Drew Hunter? No, I no. don't. Um, he almost made the Olympics for the, for the 10K. He, he came in fourth. Really good runner. He, he like he won Fort Locker finals or something. But I I think we're doing a heck of a job, better job on training. But there's definitely a lot of better physios out here that we're. Mm. I, I think we're not just doing. We're not just better on the intensity and run more volume and and do this kind of workout thing. I think we're we're probably getting better there. But I think we're definitely doing a better job with the small things, the strength training, plyo training, uh, count, again counter rotation. I think we got a lot. I think we have better physios out there, better trainers that are giving these to runners and it's helping us, it's helping us just handle more volume and handling more load. I think that's definitely, that has to be part of it. And the couch stretch. I mean, come on, the couch, couch. stretch is out there. hundred percent couch stretch. <laughs> that's the key. Hey, I can't remember. I think it's chapter one. I can't remember exactly where it is in the book, but you talk about the mind body connection. Can you mm -hmm. explain what you mean by that and how it relates to running? Mm -hmm. The, yeah, the mind body connection, Scott is I'm, I, I, I want runners to understand and, and I want them to, to move properly and not just go for a run, put the headphones in and I'm just, I'm just running. Like I want, yeah. like when I run now and I used to do that, I'm not saying I was, I, I used to do this myself. I put the headphones in, I'm just going to go run the go run. But now when I run, cause I've had back issues before. Uh, I, I, first of all, I do a warm up, a little bit of a warm up. but when I'm running, I'm very aware. I'm very attuned to what I'm doing. Like I, I can feel if I'm counter rotating the right, I can actually feel it. I'm like, my core is, my core is engaging. If I don't counter rotate the right way, I'll feel my back start to act up. And I'm like, no, I, I got to fix it a little bit. Sometimes I'll stop and do a quick little stretch. But I, I think the, the brain body connection is, are you, are you can, first of all, controlling your motion, but are you moving the way you're supposed to move? Mm. And this applies more than just running. If you're doing a Bulgarian split squat, uh, 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 first of all, do you feel the glutes working? Is it not just all in your quads? And uh, is your knee caving in like crazy? Do you feel like your arch is activating? So that brain body connection is being aware of, of how you're moving. And, and I, I believe Jay talks about this too, but I know they've done studies on like, if you're not paying attention to what you're doing, like you're not going to see as much gains and results versus if you actually are paying attention. So a, a really low hanging fruit running exercise wise is, is actually pay attention. Cool part about stretching is though, you can watch the Olympics, do the couch stretch. <laughs> you don't need much of a brain body connection as much there, but when you're doing, you know, Bulgarian split squats, running form, counter rotation, those kinds of arch control stuff, those kinds of exercises really focus on what you're doing. It's just, you're, you're learning. Like when, I, when I'm in school studying grad school, I mean, one of the hardest things I've done is get, go through a doctoral level program you like you're studying something you have to pay attention think of it the same way you make your brain is adapting it's, it's 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 adding on more neural connections that's how we get better at things and that's how we can become better runners and more coordinated runners okay you've inspired me dr matt um i i am gonna take out my earbuds this week and uh and maybe put pause on the audiobook that i'm listening to um, and, and put some effort into paying attention, getting my mind engaged in what I'm doing. But I think I'm going to take some baby steps here. I don't <laughs> think that I'm going to go full on, no more headphones, no more music, no more audio books, no more thinking about problems at work and how I can solve those. Because mm -hmm. that's one of the main reasons why I run is to enjoy and to get inside myself and, and, and solve problems or, or be entertained. But I am going to throw in a workout here and there where 
it's focused, no earbuds. I'm going to focus on the counter rotation. I'm going to focus on the heel strike. I'm going to, I'm going to maybe do some warm ups and, and try to loosen the hips up and be focused on that rather than just popping out of my truck and <laughs> put press and play and going for a run. So yeah. thank you. I'm inspired. Yeah. You know, I, and- I learned some of this stuff early do in the uh, weightlifting bodybuilding days back before I started running uh, and had a good mentor that talked about listening to the body, mm-hmm. listen to the bicep on the way up, on the way down, whatever body part we are working. Mm-hmm. He taught me to listen to that work. And then I, and then I brought that, carried that forward to running. And, and there's so many things to listen to. You can listen to your yeah. gait. <laughs> you can listen to y- your cadence. Hit, hit the ground to your breath. You can listen to, if you're climbing a hill, what's what's the muscle most engaged to climb that hill? It's going to be one of your larger muscles, your glutes, right? Yeah. So listen to the glute. Are you engaging that glute when you're taking that step and pulling forward? So if you just let happen whatever happens, who knows what happens? But if, if yeah. that muscle is engaged and is the power mover up that hill, then engage it, listen to it, and see if you're maximizing it. I, that's one of the things that I've enjoyed you know, learning, running out there, if there's some silence, you can do that. Yeah. And going off what Scott said, it, it is hard to be like the whole 10 miles, I'm going to (laughs) focus on it. Like, and I, I was in Flagstaff for, which it was amazing being there, but run free training, which I think Ryan Hall is one of the founders of it's just like an online kind of training for runners. They, uh, they invited me out. Uh, I brought the book. I presented on a few topics, but Ryan presented, one day and someone asked him like, you know, when someone's running, like, I think they asked him about like running efficiency. And one thing that he talked about was like, it's like, when you're like, you watch runners run, like, they're not like, I'm going to try so hard. And like, you don't stiffen up and like focus on it so hard. It's just, <laughs> it's a relaxed. I'm just aware of it. I'm not like, I'm going to focus on my back. What's my back? Like, <laughs> no, 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 don't do that. We're not like, not a hundred percent of your attention is there. It's just, it's free flowing. You're relaxed. It's a different mindset. I, I still let my brain wander, but I'm just, I'm very, it's like a relaxed, I, it's hard to describe. It's I'm in the zone. It's a relaxed, I'm in tune with things. I'm just letting my brain wander, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just aware of what my body's doing. So it's not like I'm going to focus on what I'm, it's not that it's a much more relaxed, just being aware. I don't, I, I didn't like the word focus. I think being aware of how you're moving is probably a better way of, of saying it. You kind of, okay. you kind of, oh, oh. you kind of check in and, and check back out. You can let your mind yeah. wander a bit, whether it's cadence you're listening to or gluteal muscles contracting, you just check in and let it go. Check in, let it go. That's a nice way of making sure things stay engaged by just being aware. Sorry, Scott, I just cut you off. <laughs> I was just going to say you, you've, you've made me envision this a little bit differently because I was going to be focused. I was going to be, I'm going to be in charge here. And, and, and I like that idea that you can, you can, you know, kind of stay in the flow state and just be aware. Um, you mentioned something a few minutes back and I wanted to to bring that up in chapter seven. And, and I didn't think I was going to see a, a chapter on this, but you spent a whole chapter on breathing. Mm. Yep. As a physiotherapist, why breathing? Why did you dedicate one chapter out of eight on breathing? The diaphragm? It's a muscle? It's a muscle. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I actually, that was the last chapter I added. I almost it, it, I almost didn't make it in, but I'm like, I read the book uh, Breath by, I believe it's by James Nestor. I don't know if you guys have heard of that book. It, it's, it is an amazing book. Maybe. Uh, I mean, there's a lot to it, but he talks about the benefit of nasal breathing and how, uh, like back, I believe back in like the 70s, it was either 70s or 80s. They did all this research about how uh, if you if you hold your if you if you fully inhale and hold your breath, there's no benefit to holding your breath. You know, essentially, they said breath holding training doesn't do. There's no benefit to it at all. Uh, but I'm like, well, why do swimmers do that? Why do swimmers like they'll take 10 strokes and take a breath or take five strokes and take a breath. Like swimmers do that all the time. Like, and they're seeing benefits. I, it just didn't make any sense. And, and I, and in the book, I said, I learned that when you fully exhale and then you're, when you're focusing on an exhale, if you can add these into if running. It's very challenging to do that. You can add it into running training, but when you're fully exhaling and holding your breath on the, I mean, you're fully exhale as far as you can, or at least that like you've gotten 75% of the air out that's where you see some benefits. And the, the point is 
Uh, first of all, we can train your diaphragm 100%. I like the, uh, there's that like the band I put around your, you can put a band around your ribs. You can learn how to instead of like this upper trap breathing, mm -hmm. we can breathe. Th I want to breathe 360 degrees. I like the chest is expanding out, the abdomen is expanding out laterally in the ribs, but pushing backwards as well helps you perfume, uh, helps you just uh, get more air and oxygen into your lungs. Number one, that's one thing. But if we can become like a lot of people overbreathe, we, we are not, we don't know how to ex we're not used to exhaling fully. And when you fully exhale, there's, there's much less residual oxygen uh, in, in your lungs. And it's just, we're just not used to that. There's a, it's, it's this buildup of carbon dioxide. Our body's super sensitive to that. And I remember when I was a lifeguard, I'm like, I had a hard time just going underwater. I'm like, I just have to breathe super quick. Uh, but if we can train ourselves to get used to fully exhaling and holding a breath a little bit, it builds up your CO2 tolerance, which is essentially higher levels of co2 it's gonna there's chemo there's chemical receptors in our brainstem and our heart that tell us to oxygen actually doesn't make us breathe that's buildup of carbon dioxide that does um so that tells us to breathe but you can actually train those receptors most people it's way too sensitive we can train these receptors to be less sensitive so we can actually be comfortable but you'll just feel more more the urge to breathe will be less you can you'll be more comfortable uh, with higher levels mm. of CO2. And the benefit of that to, uh, is, Don and Scott, is it helps oxygen diffuse off of red blood cells onto myoglobin that's in muscles. So essentially, higher levels of CO2 help you use oxygen more efficiently, which is like, that's going to help. The swimmers do that. They do that all the time. They do these breath training. Why are we not doing that as runners? Super low hanging mm. fruit that, first of all, let's get our diaphragm moving the right way. Second of all, let's add some CO2 training on. And I'd love to talk about uh, Emil Zetapak, who's like that, the Czechoslovakian runner back in the 50s. Let's talk about this uh, 1950s runner, and I'd say his name if I heard it one more time. <laughs> but, 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 we talked about him, Don. <laughs> we did. We've talked about Zetapak a lot of times on the podcast. Oh, uh, well, you know, I'm forgetful. So um, <laughs> so we've got, uh, um, we can increase what you're saying, doctor. We can increase the volume of our lung capacity, but we can also improve the efficiency of oxygen carbon dioxide exchange at, at that level too is that is that what i just heard you say about uh, uh training doing some breathing training yes and think of the volume capacity is going to come from we're just we're just using more of our lungs pretty mm -hmm. much it's not like right. we're able to like we're not like able to oh we do this we're going to be able to take in more oxygen uh just by itself but because we're able to exhale or uh, exhale more and then uh, but just by definition we're able to to use more of our lung capacity um, and what was the second part of that, Don? Sorry. Um, oh, well, the exchange rate after after you've increased oh, the yeah, volume yeah, yeah. of the lungs, there's some some magic that happens between blood yes. cells and. Yep. So the ha those higher levels of CO2, your body's like, oh my gosh, there's higher levels of CO2. Like it just it helps oxygen fall off of hemoglobin. It just help it helps it diffuse mm -hmm. more. So it's you have this diffusion cascade where higher levels of CO2. It's like we want to like the oxygen just it, it's easier for it to get into your muscles and essentially use oxygen for aerobic uh, just aerobic energy. So what you're saying is we get better when we train something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and, and speaking of that, uh, you know, I just can't uh, express how good this book is. So I turned to chapter seven and there's a section in chapter seven called CO2 training. And it goes through the basics, how uh, you can use some of the techniques. It has some techniques in here mm -hmm. that you can use and practice. So it's not just theoretical stuff. This is... It's spelled out so that you can try it yourself. It can walk you through how to breathe better and how to use this CO2 um, breathing pattern a little bit better. So kudos, great, great workbook here, Matt. Can you combine that breathing technique with couch stretching? I mean, you could <laughs> double up. You know, you, you can. Uh, Multitasking. You can multitask. I think it's funny, the uh, with the meals at a pack, you know, if we want to talk about him, he did... Um, I don't know how many of these he did. He did these things where he would like, there's a tree over there. I'm going to go hold my breath and run to the tree. So he, I mean, he would, sometimes he would pass out too. He took it to an extreme. <laughs> we don't want people passing out. That's not the goal, but just adding on, you know, one of them is, I don't know about the top of my head. I believe it's buteco breaths. There's carbon dioxide, trio two training and a buteco breaths. One of them is more intense, but essentially it's, we're, we're trying to just, elongate and exhale so like a, a, a three count inhale followed by a six count exhale and you're well through hopefully through my nose just getting used to fully exhaling and if you're not used to it it is it's hard it's like you're like oh my it just feels like there's an anchor in your chest 
Uh, but if we can get used to that, it's now when we're running and our, we're, we're, we're working hard, man, we're, it's hard to get air, oxygen in it and breathe out. It's, it, it makes, it's going to make that easier for you. So even if we do this without ru- doing it with running, it is hard. And if you, if there's videos of Emil Zetapak running, now, first of all, I, I mean, he did stuff, uh, Scott and Don that, I mean, back in the, I believe it was the late fifties that will never be done again. I mean, I, I don't know if you got, I'm sure you guys know this, but he's the only person that will ever, he won gold in the 5,000, gold in the 10,000, and he won the Olympic marathon. And he's never <laughs> ran that distance before. He's the, anywhere he beat the current world record holder. No wow. one will, there's no way anyone will ever do that again. He's, he did it. I think he ran like a 220 marathon. And to me, that has, part of that has to be from this CO2 training. I'm trying to remember, Don, maybe you told me this. Um, Don is a former Marine. Or is a Marine. What do you say again, Don? Once a Marine, Marine, always. No, once a Marine, always a Marine. Yeah, former Marine. So you're a Marine. Not an ex-Marine and, unless you're disarmed with discharge. No, no, no. I, did, <laughs> I knew it was an ex-Marine, but I, w- I wanted to make sure that I was I was respectful oh, good. of that. For all the Marines um, out there. Right. Um, and, and maybe it's Marine, maybe it's uh, SEALs or whatever, but they did something. And you mentioned in that, in that chapter, Matt, um, the double breath technique. Mm. And it's a way of, of, of calming or focusing where you inhale and then you inhale again. And yep. I think that's a, a, a great breathing technique that I've tried before. And I think it works. Where, did you tell me about that, Don? No, if it, it sounds good. So I'd like to take credit for it. Yeah. So okay. I did, yeah, I'll give you credit. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. The, the double breath. I, I'm, I'm sure there's a relaxation benefit to it, but for running and it, it works really well for running. Like I've tried it on like, a row machine or like the echo bike, like they're big, those are like big pieces of cardio equipment and, and for CrossFit, but it works really well with running because you can get into a rhythm of it. Like a, the whole point of yeah. that for running is it, it helps keep your lungs inflated when you're, especially when you're running hard, when you're running easy, it's not as big of a deal, but when you're running aggressively and hard, our lungs, t- just for how, how fast and how forceful the air is coming in and out, our lungs tend to collapse a little bit. They're not as they're, they just don't uh, expand and fill with air as much as they should. This, mm. that double inhale, it helps keep the, it helps keep the lungs inflated. Uh, and I, I found that out when I was in high school, I would run. I was a super loud breather and people were like, they can hear me coming a mile away. My teammates, <laughs> But I, I adopt this breathing pattern. And I also have, I believe I have like a slightly deviated septum. So I, it, let alone it's hard to breathe through your nose anyway, but I would, I would do this thing. It sounded like this. <sighs> So I breathe in through my nose, in through my mouth and nose at the same time. But I just incorporated this double breath as I would race 5Ks. And it, it, it helped. I believe it helped a lot. Uh, at least. Even it, I, sorry, go at ahead. Least, so at least it didn't whistle when you did it, because that would be a giveaway <laughs> that you were coming. Uh, yeah, it did not whistle. And I did Murph. You guys know what Murph is? It's like you run. It's a, like a CrossFit workout. You do a mile with a 20-pound weight vest. You do a bunch of pain and torture of squats, push-ups, pull-ups. And then you finish with another mile uh, uh, with the weight vest on. And the second mile, I mean, I'm toast. It's you do so many squats and pushups and pull-ups, but I incorporate that double breath, and it was it. I mean, huh. It was like five breaths later, running became easier. And I'm like, it, it, wow. it, it works. It works. It's it's it, it's it, for running. It works super super well. Wow. Uh, hey, Doctor Matt, great book. We're 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 digging into some really good things. I'm my my list of golden nuggets is getting larger and larger. Um, <laughs> You specialize in treating runners. You've probably seen hundreds of them come through your door. What is the most common injury or pain that runners uh, come in with that you deal with on a daily basis? I'm sure there's Mm -hmm. the 80-20 rule, right? What's What's the number one issue? Uh oh, like like what's causing their pain? Pretty much, like what's the root cause of it? Right. Yeah, I I'd say it's it's probably. a lot, a lot of hip stiffness is it's hip stiffness is part of it. It's, it's almost like, what's the root cause of it. A lot of times it is hip stiffness because that can cause the running form changes. So hip stiffness, whether that's the rectus femoris, the psoas muscle, like these, the quad muscles, essentially, that's a big one. Um, I, I think just not being, uh, cause a lot of run a lot of time when running, we're like, we think we just have to run again. Running does not make you stronger. It makes you a more efficient runner. Like running doesn't necessarily going to translate into rowing or it's not going to translate into using uh, into cycling. It's running is it, like cardio is very sport specific. So running is going to make you a better runner. Uh, I think neglecting 
uh, strength. It's not just hip strength. Like the glutes actually aren't the most used muscle when running. It's the soleus, the calf muscle, and the hamstrings. Those are two most used muscles when distance running. So if we just, if all we do is hip thrust, we might be neglecting the calves and the hamstrings. So I think a, a, a kind of two low hanging fruit that like what causes, what are some big root causes of problems uh, I'd say is hip tightness. And that could be from the quad or the hip joint or the psoas and just uh, strength of the calf muscle and the hamstrings along with the glute as well. If counter rotation so important, and I believe that it is, are there some exercises we should do to help mm. strengthen that that uh, mm. process? Or, or maybe th- I'll leave it at that. Yeah, it's the the, the counter rotation is this delicate balance, Don. Of is that brain body connection, right? It's that neuromuscular. We have to learn how to rotate the right way, but also we have to have a level of strength. We have to have the core strength and the hip strength. So when when we're, how, we, how can we improve counter rotation? I mean, there's in the book, there's a bunch of different ways to improve it, but I, I included, I think the counter rotation chapter, I'm like, I, I couldn't, I, I could have included core strength in the strength section. I just moved that to the counter rotation chapter, because if you're going to counter rotate the right way, we have to have a strong core. So I just made like strengthening the core and learning to counter rotate, they go hand in hand. So you have to have a level of strength to, to be able to have that neuromuscular connection as well. Yeah, core strength. I, I remember hearing the saying, you can't fire a cannon from a canoe. You yeah. need to have a strong yeah. core to get power out of your thighs. You need a strong core. Yep. Yeah, the core, it's the tr- It's like the like if you got a big tree with big branches, you got to have a thick trunk to support mm. all those branches. And the branches are arms and really for runners, it's more legs than arms. But we have to have this nice, stable core that's able to, for running, it's actually like lifting. Lifting's a lot more of anti rotation. Like they do like a parallel mm. press, the band's like over. Like we want to resist. For running, we want to be doing those things. They're in the book. We do talk about parallel presses. That's really important for like, I'm an Olympic weightlifter, I'm a power lifter. We want a super strong core for lifting. But for running, we have this delicate balance that we also want to be strong, but move through that counter rotation. So it's this. It's as delicate. We want to be strong, but also be able to rotate. It's not, again, I'm not just, I'm going to focus and be really stiff. It's, we have to be able to move fluidly, have a level of strength, have that brain body connection as well. Yeah, no counter rotation in a squat or a lunge, although they're working your, your legs and hip flexors and, and hip extensors, you want to stay stable. So uh, I get your point, Scott, I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I remember the the first time I learned about this counter rotation uh, was a few years ago. Don and I were finishing up a run and we're heading up this hill to Rick's house. I don't know if you remember that, Don. And Don, of course, I don't know why. Well, I do know why. When we run together, I usually am up front. And the reason why is if I wasn't, Don and I wouldn't be running together because he would be out three miles ahead of me. And so I usually lead when we run, but because of that, he gets to watch the way I run a lot. And Mm -hmm. as we were climbing up that hill, he said, stop. And he explained how the upper body and the lower body counter rotated. And he says, as we're hiking this hill, let's be as more most efficient as we can hiking this hill, rotate your upper body, bring the hip, you know, your, your right hip forward and your, your, your left shoulder forward at the same time. And he says, and you'll, you'll see that that is just easier to do. And so we practice it up that hill. And um, one of the other things, I'll just put a little note in here. We run with uh, poles a lot now too, Don and I, we just kind of like running with poles. And that's also a, a, a good timing mechanism. If you're using the poles where you're counter rotating the upper body and the lower body, it's a good kind of practice or, 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 uh, um, it's a good cue. Yeah. Uh, cue. Yeah, exactly. And, and Matt, in fairness, the reason Scott thinks I have a great gait is because I tell him that I do. <laughs> I, I've never seen him run. I've, <laughs> Matt, I've never seen Don run ever. And that's why I'm wondering why he says I have a great gait and I've really improved it. He's never seen me. He actually may be walking <laughs> and keeping up with me. I have no idea whether he's running. <laughs> you know, you just take his word for it. It's like, Hey, he's giving you great <laughs> advice. It's, it's totally fine. Uh, but that's, that's a big part of the, the like retraining running form and learning counter right. rotation. Like we can do all these exercises and focus on them, but sometimes cues were great. Like, uh, or, or sometimes I'll actually wearing a weight vest, getting a little bit of pressure. Like when I run, I run with my 20 pound weight vest. I mean, it's harder to run. Don't get me wrong, but I, I actually feel like I have a little, it's easier for me to counter rotate. Uh, Cause a little mm. bit of pressure actually, it, 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 it brings, it just brings more awareness to your body. It's like, 
if I put like on the arch, uh, the, the arch chapter in the book, uh, like orthotics, the only reason a lot of orthotics actually people think they help is because it, it feels like something's on their arch. It, it helps with that neuromuscular connection. And sometimes, I mean, we can talk, there's other cases, there's smaller, there's not as many cases where like you need to have that rigid arch. And that's something like we, we, we got 20 minutes, we could dive into that. But just having some tactile cueing brings awareness to something. And then it, oh, you have more control over it. It helps you move that, helps you activate the arch muscles better, helps you counter rotate better with that weight vest on or with, hey, just hey, l- drive that elbow back farther. Like, oh, that feels easier to run. So a lot of times cues, verbal cues and tactile cues can go a long way. I think Dr. Mark Kukazella talked about a rubber band exercise where you put a rubber band around your torso and uh, somewhere in your arm somehow to work on counter rotation. Do you recall that, Scott, or am I hallucinating? I think you... Yeah, the big band, and yeah. you put your thumbs we'll, in it. We'll or have something. to look. We'll have to look that up. Somebody oh, out there with the band, and you do this, <laughs> uh, something like that. Some, some, I don't remember. If Doctor Kukazella is listening to this, no, he's <laughs> he knows, but somebody knows that listening to this. I don't remember. Heck, I didn't remember. That was six hundred episodes ago. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> hey, Matt, great book uh, once again. What do you hope people? Well, let me let me rephrase that question. How can we best use this resource, this book, mm-hmm. to become better runners? How would you, wh- how would you recommend someone use the book? Starting on chapter one, mm-hmm. reading it cover to cover, going to a section like I, I mentioned, I have some knee pain. Going to a section and looking at at the the exercises for knee pain and and understanding that. How how do you suggest this be used by runners? Yeah, I think that though, that's, that's a really good question, Scott, because uh, uh, in the beginning, I'm like, I just don't want people to like, I got knee pain, flip the chapter eight, runner's knee. Cool. Because uh, I want you to go through the chapters and learn them. If you have something going on, like you got a race coming up in two weeks and you're like, ah, uh, first of all, seeing a physio is, <laughs> that can help too. But if you're like, hey, I got right. runner's knee, I want to flip to the the runner's, the runner's knee chapter, go for it. Like, that's going to bring you to the other chapters. And that's honestly too, that's going to, it's going to bring you to spots where if you do some ankle mobility tests, like, Oh man, my ankle's locked up. Hey, you should probably work on this. It's probably going to help your knee pain. Uh, but if you got something going on, feel free to go to chapter eight and, and, and you got plantar fasciosis. Hey, go to the plantar fasciosis chapter. Totally fine. Um, but I do recommend people start in chapter one, uh, like go through it section by section. If you know, you got a weak spot, if you know, like, hey, things are like, you know, you're weak, you're like, you know, you have to do strength training, you can start on that chapter as well. If you're like, I'm not interested in running form, or like, I think my running form is pretty good, feel free to skip it. I'm, I mean, I'd go back to it eventually. But if you know, you have something that is a low hanging fruit, that you are really motivated to hit, go hit, find that chapter, hit it up. I think a big one is arch control. I think a lot of people would benefit from that one. But I think going through it chapter at a time, it's dense, it's thick, mm. full of value and knowledge. So I'd go through it chapter by chapter. If there's nothing that you're like, hey, I really want to learn this or you really don't have anything crazy going on, I would recommend doing that. But if you have a passion about something or you have, know you have an ankle pain or injury, feel free to flip to those chapters uh, and dive in and start there. And, and I would add, if you want to prevent having an issue, read through it and understand what might be in front of you right. and what you can do now not to end up with that cumulative repetitive stress. Now, now not to throw yeah. any physiotherapist <laughs> under the bus. Um, we don't want to do that. How would you recommend finding a physiotherapist that has knowledge or Good practical question. at this? Because not you yeah. go through the, you know, I'll say phone book to date myself of, of from long ago. You go through the phone book, put your finger on a name. That doesn't ensure that you're going to get, you know, a Matt Silver behind that name. Mm-hmm. Or it's, someone that specializes in running. Yeah. Yeah. Versus bowling. Yeah. It, it's tough. I think there's, I we're, we're getting better at it. On the West Coast, I think there's there's a, 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 a solid quality of physical therapists that that specialize in runners, that treat runners. I'm on the East Coast in Maryland. Uh, there's definitely not as many here. It, we're, it's a, a much rarer breed, much more of a niche on the East Coast here. I think you definitely got to do your research. Uh, I would, you know, I mean, I, I Google, like typically people find us, they Google like physical therapy for runners uh, and they do the research. They find out, they, though, they read my bio, they find out about me. So I would... Just make sure you do your due diligence, just like any other profession. There's great physical therapists and there's really bad physical therapists that I wouldn't send my parents to. And I'm like, I just, you know, I wouldn't send this. I, I, a big part is doing your research. Um, 
uh, we do see like personally our practice, like, I mean, I see people, we see people locally. We have a good chunk of people since the book came out where we treat virtually. That's an option for mm. people. Not, you know, there's no pressure to do that, but if you're having a hard time finding someone close to you, we do treat people virtually. And also people get the book and they're like, I trust Matt. And I'm like, fine, that's great. Uh, but I highly recommend do your research, right? Look, a look at reviews, look at the practice. Um, I, I think like my practice is we, we give people a lot of one-on-one time. And one thing I hated when I started as my started at a, as a career, when I was in Buffalo doing my clinicals, I'd see three to four people an hour. And I'm like, I, I'm not, wow. first of all, I, I just didn't know as much back then, but I'm like, I, I don't think I'm getting anybody better. I'm throwing heat packs on, I'm ultrasounding somebody. It was very challenging to get someone better, especially someone who does CrossFit and running where there's, it looks simple to run, but there's all these complex moving parts where we have to spend more time to dive in and find that root cause of the issue. So I highly recommend people find, find a practitioner who can spend time with you and not just, I'm going to see you for 30 minutes and pass you off to the assistant, or here's a list of exercises. You need to have one-on-one -on -one time with somebody who, who you're communicating with. That can, it's not, I hated seeing three people an hour as a clinician and as a patient, like that would also irk me of like, I don't feel like I'm a making progress would be getting the attention and value that, that I think people deserve. You know, I'm going to add one more. Not that, that wasn't a complete answer, but, but to, it's, it's okay to interview your treater, to tell them what you're after, give them a little history. And then very importantly, use your instincts. If it doesn't seem right, then it probably isn't right. If it sounds like it's mm -hmm. going to work, then it's probably going to work. You have to have faith and belief in your treater, number one. And if you enter a relationship without the trust, you probably won't do the exercises or believe that it will work. So, you, you know, it's okay to ask questions and it's very much okay to listen to your instincts. Very important. Good point. Yeah. Hey, Matt, um, tell us, uh, do you have a website if someone wants to learn more about you uh, and your, your practice if they're on the East Coast? Uh, how can we get in touch with you? Yeah, uh, easiest way, if uh, it's Alpha Project Physio. Uh, dot com and physio is p h y z i o. I made it with a z because I thought that'd be cool. I don't know. So <laughs> Alpha Project Physio with a z. dot com. Um, you can also get the book from us there. If you type in "built to run book," I mean it is on Amazon. But if you do want to get it, I highly recommend you get it from us directly. It, I mean, I've shipped it to you guys. It took like you guys. You guys are on the West Coast, right? Yep. Yeah, it, it took like three days to get there. So that, the shipping we do yeah. is pretty fast. I can't. It's not Amazon Prime fast, but it's give me an extra two days, I'll get the book to you. We also include a free do, gift do we, in there. Uh, so if you want to get the book, uh -huh. highly recommend check it. Check it on the website. Um, we we send them out. We're pretty diligent with it. Um, and also you get added on to our newsletter, which I try once a week to send out info that's not even in the book. Of uh, hey, here's no. I, I I saw a couple a patient with a bone stress injury, and I'm like, I think this week's is going to be on. I got to do it Saturday, but this week's is going to be on coming back from a stress reaction or a stress fracture, which is stuff I didn't even include in the book is that would have been an extra 50, 50, hundred pages. Amazon, um, Amazon doesn't do that. You, you don't, you don't, <laughs> Jeff Bezos isn't given his uh, two cents every week. Yeah. They, they, they like to, the, they don't, they don't, they don't do that. If you want to get it from there, that's fine. But uh, if you want to get it from us, I highly recommend check it out. Just Google built to run. It'll bring it right to the alpha project website. Um, but yeah, if any, I think that's how you can get the book. If you are interested in working with us, um, whether in person or virtually check us out on the website as well. Um, and yeah, we've had an influx of that since the book came out and, uh, treating people virtually, it's definitely different, but like record yourself running, we'll assess it and we'll see how it looks. And there's a lot of stuff we could do virtually that it's, it, it, it works fairly well. So whether it's book or that, I uh, would love to hear from anybody who, uh, or email me too at alpha project physio. Uh, actually it's Matt at alpha project physio.com. Uh, which if you get the book, that email is included in there as well. But yeah, anybody has any questions about stuff, feel free to email me there. Hey, before we go, Matt, I just got to ask you, it is Olympic season, and I've got two questions. I'm going to ask them one at a time. Yeah, yeah. Have you... <laughs> have you? That was a dig, Matt. That was a dig directed at me. Did you feel it? Did you feel it? I think that's passive aggressive behavior. So my psoas <laughs> just, just seized up. You got to do the couch stretch, Scott. You got to couch stretch it out. So, so um, have you watched the Olympics and some of the runners and ask yourself, that is such poor form. How is this person even doing it? Or are mm. all the Olympic athletes so tuned in that mm. you couldn't even make it that far unless you were efficient? What has been your observation? Yeah, they're, good I, mean, question. I haven't watched them live. I watched a lot of the replays. Um, I've just been busy doing other stuff. But uh, I, 
uh, rarely do I see, I'm like, Hey, that running form is what's going on with that. It's mm. there. I mean, I'm not, there's not like, there is, I guess, a standard for running form, but think of it like a bell curve. We could be a dev, a standard deviation off, but all of the basics. And there, again, there's differences in leg length, differences in torso length that we'll see differences in cadence because mm. longer legs or cadence is probably gonna be slower than someone who's, you know, five, three and has really short legs. Uh, but the basics are there. The uh, an optimal, you know, an optimal cadence is there. It's like not over striding. I mean, I, mean, I remember I actually videotaped uh, a marathon uh, on my iPhone on the computer. I recorded, uh, there was some marathon. It was like uh, maybe Tokyo marathon. The amount of hip extension, these runners, it's like 30 degrees of hip extension. Most of us are like lucky if we get 15, but you just run faster, mm. you'll get more. But they have like 30 to 25 degrees of hip extension. They are doing the basics really, really well. And uh, for they have to for them. Their volume is at a level. Yes, they have all these resources from recovery tools to, hey, they're able to get the optimal amount of sleep because they're professional athletes and you know they get paid to do it. But man, everything, all the basics are dialed in. And there's going to be some differences with how tall they are and their body type and all these other things. But man, the basics are dialed in. Like they're, they're, most of them have a fantastic amount of hip extension. They're not over striding. Their cadence is where it needs to be. They're doing the thing. And that's why it looks so smooth. They're doing the small things right. So, Interesting. so now you'll, you'll recognize why this was tempting to make a two-part question in the first question. How about driving through town and watching runners uh -huh. drive down? <laughs> Do you look over at a runner and a set to see if they, they sh they'll be in my office soon? <laughs> Do you, do you, you fingernails know. on a chalkboard? Do you feel your your spine just tingle when you see most runners? You know, I I, I realize I'm like, hey, not everyone's a professional athlete. I'm like, not everyone's a professional runner, and I, you can get away with that for a while. If you're just doing ten miles a week, and you're like, hey, you're overstriding a little bit, your your uh, your 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 cadence is a little bit slower. Uh, I, yeah, you can get away with it probably for a while. I mean, first I'm like, I want to fix everyone. I'm like, you yell at the window, hey, here's my car. Like, <laughs> I could do that, but uh, you know, it's. If, 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 Hey, your, if your goal is, I just want to run twice a week and hit, you know, 10 miles a week. And I don't want to, I know I'm feeling good. I don't have any aches and pains. So you're probably fine, man. But if you want to step up and I want to be competitive in 10 Ks and run fast marathons, then we have, we'll probably have to fix these things. But no, I mean, I, it's, it's, it's hard to turn. You, it's, you're never turning that brain off. I just ignore it sometimes. I'm like, ah, right, it's there, whatever. I don't care. <laughs> what am I going to do? Yell at the window at this guy? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> now I, I've enjoyed this conversation and I think the book is packed full of, of valuable uh, uh, tools and, and information. I'd like to do another podcast sometime in the future. I'd like to talk about shoes because I know you talk about mm. that heel strike versus forefoot strike. You know, there's a lot of things in there that I think we haven't talked about that I, that I still have questions on, but to, to, uh, so I'd like to, to do this again sometime if it's all right with you guys. Yeah, I, that's, <laughs> yeah. I, we, I can talk an hour about the shoes and feet and how to activate them and like how your foot is. I, I don't want to get into it now because we're just going to open up a can of worms, but I would, that would, that would be an amazing podcast. Let's open those can of worms in the future. In the meantime, you can read about it early if you want to if you want to get the book because it's right. in there and and, yep. and do your your pre your pre your homework so that when you come to that next podcast, you're a veteran yourself. And uh, I really I really enjoyed this conversation, Matt. Yeah, thanks, guys. And also, and, you get twenty percent off the book if you get it from us versus Amazon. Oh, so you get a, yeah. you get a discount. well, there you go. And. And we will have the link in the in the show notes if you're driving or running down uh, the trail right now, so that you don't have to remember that. I, I love it that the title is an aspirational title. We are built to run, much like Christopher McDougall's book, Born to Run. We were born to run, but we were not only just born to run, but we were built to run. We're bipedal yep. running machines, and we only mess up because we mess up ourselves. If we pay attention to uh, the way that we were built, mm -hmm. I think that we can become efficient runners and be able to run, as Matt says, run now and for the rest of our life. So Matt, thank you so much for uh, giving that as that aspiration. Running should be fun. It should be yeah. enjoyable and uh, we should be able to do it for the rest of our lives. Yeah. There's my opinion. There's nothing like running. It's I feel free when I run. It's just, it's different than biking. It's a whole different experience. And it's, I, there's, I think there's something innate, like we've been doing it for, we haven't been biking for thousands of years. We've been, we've been running for, th for hundreds of tens of thousands of years, however long the human, you know, how long we've been on this earth for. So yeah, there's something primal about it and being able to do that the right way. I, I, this just gives you, gives me a sense of pleasure. I don't think anything else does. 
Well, th- th- I just thought about this, and, and we'll end on this because uh, I choose to end it. <laughs> I, I have the record button. <laughs> Think of how many Olympic sports, summer Olympic sports, have running involved in them. Not just the running events, but looks look at gymnastics. There's running involved in gymnastics. Let's think about field hockey. There's running in field hockey. Yep. There's so many sports in the Olympics that are centered around or based on running. It's because we were born and built to run, right, Freeman? That's right. So uh, should, should we include that in the end? Well, you know, I, I think you crafted that so well. I think we should move it to the front. I think it's it's very powerful. <laughs> So Matt, thank you so much. And and at that yep. point, we usually say, now go out and grab that book, find out what's going on and listen to your body and go out and run. Mas. <laughs> <laughs>